here are the details of how it is the DNA polymerase 3 operates. And again, we're still sort of looking at this in a schematic cartoonish way. This cartoon's a little bit better though. You can see here, this is the actual dub double helix of the DNA. And then here's the replication fork. This is supposed to represent helicase. Again, this geometry isn't exactly correct. These you should recognize as the single strand DNA binding proteins on both sides of the replication fork. And here, this is the leading strand. You can see it's moving in the same direction as the helicase. Here are the lagging strand uh, pieces. These are the Okazaki fragments and so forth. But what I want to do is focus right here on exactly what the DNA polymerase 3 is doing right at this moment. So you notice it's bound to this upper strand. The upper strand I'm going to call the template. The template strand is a single strand of DNA and it has a bunch of DNA bases like this. You see here, there's a T here, an A, and a C. What the DNA polymerase 3 is going to do is it's going to read these and as it reads them, it's going to then bind to a free version of the complementary base. And it has this property. You'll see how it has that property, what makes it, gives it that property when you get to grad school probably, uh, or medical school, or if you go that far. Uh, but what happens is this, is basically it sees, for example, in this case, a T, and it grabs a floating adenosine. You remember adenosine? It has the adenine base, and it's got the, the uh, uh, ribose, or in this case, deoxyribose sugar, and it has one phosphate the way we've been talking about it. Now, in reality, I'm going to add a little nuance here. In reality, the, there's not just one phosphate on this. There's actually three phosphates. So, for example, if you're looking at this, if the DNA, if the DNA polymerase is here looking at this C, it would grab a G and put it in, but not just a regular G like we'd seen before. This particular one would be a guanosine with three phosphates on it. Now, here's what I mean. Here you should recognize this is the, the deoxyribose sugar coming off of carbon number one is a guanine base. The guanine plus the sugar plus the phosphate makes it guanosine. So we've talked about this before and I said that was the nucleotide of, of, of guanosine. And this nucleotide is technically guanosine monophosphate because it only has one phosphate group on it. So it'd be GMP. What the DNA polymerase 3 is actually going to use, though, is not that monophosphate form. It's going to use the, the triphosphate form. You notice coming off of carbon number 5, there's a phosphate, then another phosphate attached to it, then another phosphate attached to it. So this is triphosphate. So this becomes GTP, guanosine triphosphate. The triphosphate forms exist for all of these nucleotides. So there's a adenosine triphosphate, ATP, which you probably heard of, but there's also CTP, TTP, UTP, all of them. They have triphosphate forms. The phosphates have the following names. This phosphate that's attached directly to the 5 prime carbon is called the alpha phosphate. The middle one is the beta, and the last one is the gamma. So alpha, beta, gamma, that's like ABC. Those are the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. Now what happens then is this. What the DNA polymerase 3 is going to do is it reads this nucleotide, like I said, grabs the triphosphate form. In this particular example here, this is the adenosine triphosphate. And then it breaks off two of the three phosphates. So if you look at this, this is the triphosphate. So there's alpha phosphate, beta phosphate, gamma phosphate. It takes these two phosphates, the beta and the gamma, and breaks them off and releases them as what's called a diphosphate or better pyrophosphate, P-Y-R-O phosphate. Now this release of those two phosphates actually supplies energy to this whole process that allows this GTP or ATP or whatever it happens to be to bind to the growing chain. So here is carbon number three. This is carbon number five. These two phosphates break off and become pyrophosphate. And this single monophosphate form binds with the five prime carbon to phosphate to three prime carbon here. And that is how the, pro how, how the process grows. In fact, that's precisely why it is. It has to always grow five prime to three prime because the phosphates are on the five prime carbon. So it always has to grow in that way. This phosphate, these two phosphates, like I said, are giving the energy for this process. Now, we haven't talked about this very much yet in, in class. We will very shortly. But technically speaking, this process of making new DNA is thermodynamically unfavorable. It doesn't happen on its own. It needs an energy source. In this case, the energy source comes from the nucleotides themselves. So that's what's happening here. The uh, DNA polymerase 3 
is reading this, breaking off those two phosphates, and it's catalyzing the formation of the following bonds. First, the hydrogen bonds that connect the two nucleotide bases together, and then the bond that connects this sugar to this sugar using this phosphate. And again, you should recognize that that, bit, that connection should be or is a phosphodiester bond. So those are the processes. That's exactly what's happening during the elongation phase of the DNA. All right, so how does this whole process of DNA replication end? Well, it doesn't end until the helicase and the DNA polymerase get to the ends of the chromosomes. And that's what's shown in this slide. Here, if you look at this, this is the leading strand. And what they're showing here, you can recognize this yellow as the primer, which hasn't been removed yet. The red is the new strand here. And here is your DNA polymerase and the helicase that are operating and moving to the right in this picture and moving all the way down, all the way down, all the way down until eventually they get to the end of the chromosome. The DNA polymerase gets to the very end of the chromosome and this upper strand is beautifully done all the way to the bottom. Again, the leading strand is the easy one. That's the one that has no real major problems that we have to deal with. The lagging strand, of course, is a pain in the butt. What happens in the lagging strand is, like we've seen before, here's an Okazaki fragment at the beginning of it, and there's its primer. And then here are the SSBPs that are holding this replication fork open long enough for a primer to come in here, uh, primase, I should say, to come in here and, and lay the primer down. But notice the primer is not at the end of the chromosome. So there is, a, there is a sort of an overhang on this side of the chromosome. So as we know, what's going to happen is a new DNA polymerase 3 is going to come and bind, but only to the 3' prime end of the primer which means it's going to go to the left in this picture. So there it is. It binds the three prime end of the primer, moves to the left until it gets to the uh, next Okazaki fragment. And then after DNA polymerase 1 has done its job and after uh, ligase has done its job, now the lagging strand looks just as beautiful as the leading strand. Everything is perfect. The primers have been removed and the ligase has done its job and ligated together all the Okazaki fragments, but there's still this end of the chromosome that's unreplicated. So what happens then is after this process is complete, this single strand overhang gets removed, gets cut off. And so now the chromosome is a little bit shorter than it was before the replication occurred. And this happens every single time a chromosome gets replicated. There's a little tiny bit at the end that gets cut off. That little tiny bit though, if you repeat this process over and over again, that little tiny bit, each one adds up to something being very significant. So you can degrade enough of this. If you re replicate this chromosome enough, you can degrade the end enough that it'll destroy the function of that chromosome. And all kinds of weird things start to happen. We'll talk about, we won't talk about those in this class, but in your upper division class, you'll see that once it gets down low enough, then the ends of the chromosomes of different chromosomes will come and join together, cause all kinds of problems. And so there's a limit to how many times a cell can divide because of this. And this is important in understanding both cancer and aging because it's thought that aging anyway can occur at least in part because the chromosomes start to degrade to the point where they can no longer function properly. How many times can you replicate a chromosome before you start running into trouble? The answer is about 30. After 30 replications, the ends of the chromosomes are damaged enough and they're starting to cause enough damage to the physiology of the, of the chromosome that the cell recognizes something is going on and it hunkers down and it stops replicating. It resists dying, but it won't do anything except be a cell. It won't replicate. It won't respond to replication signals anymore. If it does, that means something probably has gone wrong, which is one of the steps that lead to cancer. And it'll start replicating again under certain pathological circumstances. And so these ends will continue to degrade after 30, but not more than about 40 or 50. At that point, then the cell completely dies unless it's able to upregulate an enzyme that rebuilds these ends of the chromosomes that are called telomeres. That enzyme is called telomerase. We're not going to talk in detail about what telomerase does in this class, but again, you'll see that in your upper division courses. So these, this process of the degradation of the ends of the chromosomes, the telomeres, is something that, again, is, is very important in pathology and in aging. So it's something that I want you to be able to see so that when you see it in your upper division classes, you recognize its significance. But that's how the process ends. And that also means because of that, chromosomes cannot replicate indefinitely unless they can rebuild the ends of those chromosomes, the ends of the telomeres. So far, everything I've shown you 
has been very cartoonish and very schematic in its, uh, in its presentation. I want to just give you a taste of the complexity, not all of it. There's no way I can show you everything that we know about what this process is uh, without completely overwhelming you. It overwhelms graduate students as well. So, and that's not the point. The point is we want to understand how this thing actually looks in reality. And what it looks like is basically this. This is an example of a simplified example of one uh, that comes from a bacteriophage. Uh, this whole complex here has in it the helicases. These are the DNA polymerase 3s. The primase is also in here. And a number of other enzymes, which I haven't even talked about their structures, are part of this whole structure right here. So this thing here is referred to as the replosome. Some means body. S-O-M-E means body. So this is, the, this is the body that replicates the DNA. So what's happening in this whole process is everything I've shown you. It's exactly the same. Here's the DNA coming into the replosome. The helicase is separating this out. The topoisomerase is acting uh, as well. But this is opening the DNA into the replication fork here and here. This branch of the replication fork goes to this DNA polymerase 3, which makes it continuously going this way. So you notice the DNA is moving in and continues just right through that, that uh, DNA polymerase, and it makes that new DNA strand. So this is the leading strand. The lagging strand is more complicated, of course. What happens is the lagging strand goes into the helicase itself, and then it loops around, and the loop is held open by these proteins called GP2.5. All of these proteins here are some of those SSBPs I was talking about, the single-strand DNA binding proteins. And this loop is going to form an Okazaki fragment, which is being constructed by this DNA polymerase as the DNA goes this direction. So notice it's 5' prime to 3'. Prime. It's going from left to right here, out towards here to make the lagging strand. So what happens is this comes out here. The loop is stabilized by these GP2.5 SSBPs. And what happens is this then puts a primer in and starts making new DNA like this. And then it gets here. And the DNA is moving in this direction through. It's moving from right to left, which means the new DNA is being built from left to right. And it builds and builds and builds until it hits that primer. Once it hits that primer, this whole complex is going to fall off. A new complex is going to bind here and build a new Okazaki fragment here. So here's an Okazaki fragment. A new Okazaki fragment is going to be built here. Now, it's hard to see that. It's hard to, to visualize what I'm describing. So what I want to do is to actually show you this process using a video. This video was put together by the um, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, which is, as I mentioned in one of the earlier segments of this lecture, one of the most uh, celebrated laboratories in all of, of science and all of biology. In fact, much of what I've shown you in this lecture was discovered there at that laboratory. Uh, this animation is excellent. This is showing the biophysics and the structures of these enzymes and the DNA itself in a very realistic way. The only problem is I'm not sure exactly how much of this is artistic license and how much of it is actually known biophysics, but it's based on mathematical models of these actual enzyme shapes. So the enzyme shapes at least are pretty accurate, and the whole replosome here is also quite accurately depicted. Now, it looks nasty. It's really complicated. Eh, yeah, it's not that complicated. If we watch it, I'm going to turn it on here in a moment, but, but I want you to look here. This is the DNA coming in to this structure here. This structure is the helicase. And you'll notice then the DNA splits going out this direction and going out this direction. Notice this is the loop, so that's the lagging strand. This is the one that goes straight out here, so that's the leading strand. All right, so we're going to go ahead and play this, and you can see that going nice, nice, nicely here. Okay, so this is just going on and on and on. Now, this is what it looks like. If you could see this moving, this is exactly what it looks like. I'm going to stop here. Notice the DNA is coming in. There's the helicase. There's the replication fork. Leading strand here, lagging strand here. Now they're going to show you this in this uh, example. But you can see here, this is again the replosome. You've got these two different enzymes that look very similar to each other. And all of this crazy stuff happens, but there you're showing, they're showing the uh, incoming DNA. This is the outgoing on the lagging strand. This is the outgoing on the leading strand. They'll start to label these things for us here shortly so you can see exactly what's going on. But right here, they're going to highlight the helicase. So that's the helicase there. Sorry, my face is right in the way. Uh, that helicase is doing what we said before. It's separating the two DNA strands. Now, here then 
is, again, that leading strand. Now, they call it, call it the three prime strand. This is called the five prime strand. And that is just a different nomenclature for essentially what we're talking about here. But this whole process you can see on the lagging strand is very complicated. Let's look, focus on the leading strand. On the leading strand right here is the DNA polymerase. That's the thing that's going to make the new DNA. And they'll highlight it here for us. There's the DNA polymerase there on the leading strand. And again, we have DNA coming into this complex. There's the polymerase, and it makes new DNA. Now, the lagging strand is a complicated one. That's what they're highlighting here. All right now, you can see there's a clamp, and all this stuff starts moving all this stuff around. And this is pretty accurate to what actually happens with this. But you see, you get this loop, and there is the polymerase right there. Okay, now, watch what happens. The polymerase is making new DNA. And you see how it's making it. There is where it began. There's where the primer is. And it's making new DNA in this direction. All right, so this is the strand coming in and it goes through the polymerase and makes new DNA. But now watch, if we continue on here, there's the Okazaki fragment, it's highlighting, and the Okazaki fragment is not done quite yet. But here, you'll see uh, this new strand of DNA being made right there. There's the polymerase it's showing on the lagging strand. So there's the new DNA being made there, right there. You see right there, that's the previous Okazaki fragment that was made. So it's gonna make this until it gets to that point right there, now watch. It goes there and stop. Now stop there. The moment this Okazaki fragment runs into that one, then this whole complex breaks off and separates off. Watch. See, it just breaks completely off. And then it loops around and makes a new one, grabs it and starts making new DNA until that previously made one gets there and then it breaks off again. So that's what happens. Every time it gets to an Okazaki fragment, it breaks that whole pro uh, uh, complex of polymerase off. A new polymerase binds and it starts making the Okazaki fragment. What is not shown here is the primase. The primase is part of this complex. What's also not shown here is the DNA polymerase 1, its action, or the, D or the DNA ligase. This is just simply showing in a simplified form, believe it or not, this is simplified, of what the actual geometry happens to be. So that is the process of DNA replication, greatly, greatly simplified. So just to remind you, as I've said all semester, uh, we're only ever scratching the surface in this course. We never get into a great, great amount of detail. There is a lot there. I understand that, and that's something that you've got to learn. And the way to deal with this kind of thing is to break it down into pieces uh, and then study each piece and then put it all together at the end. Once you've done it that way, it actually makes it much easier, and it's really not as hard as it might seem when you're first trying to learn it. First, what I would do is think about the phases. Start by looking at what's happening in the initiation phase, when the helicase binds and the topoisomerase bind and separate the DNA, then the elongation phase, putting in the primers, DNA polymerase 3, making new DNA, and continuing on in both those directions, both lagging, lagging and leading strands, and then the termination, what happens at the, at the ends of the chromosomes. Study it in that sort of pattern, and I think it'll be much easier. And in particular, what I would do is focus on the enzymes. What exactly is it that hel helicase and topoisomerase are doing? What is it that the single-stranded DNA binding proteins are doing? What is primase doing? What's DNA polymerase 3, DNA polymerase 1, ligase? What are all those things doing? So if you can remember all those enzymes, because those are the only ones I've, I've introduced, if you can remember all those enzymes and what they do, you pretty much got everything down. The only thing you got to be remember is the difference between the lagging and the leading strand. So if you can compare and contrast those two, and look at them as uh, entities that are separated in your mind, then again, that'll help you keep everything together and everything straight. But here's your goal. What you want to do is master this. What that means is you want to learn it to the point where you can teach it yourself. You can teach it to somebody else who doesn't know anything about this process at all. You want to be able to get yourself to that point where you can do it without looking at your notes. If you can do that, you'll be ready for this section on the exam.